and welcome to tonight's Miliband event. It's a very special occasion because the Ralph Miliband Lecture Series at the LSE honors the memory and critical spirit of Ed's father. We have been very fortunate to have already had David Miliband, of course, the Foreign Secretary, speak in the series, and it's a great pleasure for us and honor for us to have you here, Ed, this evening. Ralph Miliband taught at the LSE from 1949 to 1972. His teaching was inspirational, and a former LSE student, inspired by his critical vision, left a generous bequest which funds this lecture series. We began a public lecture program, the Ralph Miliband Lecture Series, with these resources in 2001, and there have been over 80 major public lectures and events since then. It is, of course, quite an extraordinary fact that Ralph Miliband and Marion Kozak, his widow sitting here this evening in the audience, had these two boys, who are now both leading cabinet ministers, and they certainly are, at the cutting edge of much which is still productive about labor, product, uh, labor politics, and it still is, and both of whom are potential contenders, shall we say, to become a prime minister in the future. I suggest in order to avoid sibling rivalry, this position becomes a job share option. <laughs> Before I introduce Ed's background with a little bit more detail, please join with me in giving him a very warm welcome. A few details before we start. Ed was born in 1969, educated at Haverstock Comprehensive School here in London, and then went on to obtain a BA from Oxford University and an MSc, he sometimes forgets, in economics here at the LSE. After completing his studies, Ed became a Labour Party researcher and quickly rose to become a special advisor to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He's been a member of Parliament for Doncaster North since 2005. He was appointed Minister for the Cabinet Office and Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster in 2007, where he led the government's efforts to tackle social exclusion, support the third sector, and coordinate the improvement in public services. From 2006 to 2007, he was Minister for the Third Sector, supporting charities, social enterprises, and community organizations. He is now, of course, Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. His talk this evening is the road to Copenhagen, a global deal on climate change, we hope, still. And he will explore the kind of politics we need if Britain is to build and sustain a consensus for long-term action dealing with climate change. Ed, thank you. David, thank you very much, and thank you to the audience for that very uh, kind uh, reception. Can I start by, if I may, paying a tribute to you, David, for uh, what you have done in relation to the Miliband lecture series. My family uh, is incredibly grateful to you. You told me that... Uh, we now, I, I'm the, something like the 80th Ralph Miliband uh, lecturer, and I noticed that I am sandwiched between Will Hutton last week and Slavo Zizek uh, next week, uh, which I think is pretty good company uh, to be in. But David, you've, you've been the inspiration behind this series, and we are uh, incredibly grateful to you. It's obviously very poignant for me to be uh, delivering uh, this lecture, and I want to obviously start by saying something about my dad. He, and I think my brother said this when he gave the Miliband Lecture, he had a very ambivalent relationship with the London School of Economics. Um, it, it was, I think, uh, the focus for this ambivalence from talking to him about it was the troubles of 1968, and he stayed here till 1972, 1973, um, but I don't think he felt it was, his relationship was quite the same uh, following those troubles. And I think what's interesting for me about uh, him and those troubles was that he felt very torn because I think he was really a sort of anti-establishment person in many ways and his resentment at the school for what happened uh, as he saw it in relation to 1968 was something that never really uh, left him. He, uh, when I say he was an anti-establishment figure, um, this uh, is something I remember from my childhood and I, I do remember he... he sort of sometimes took this to what might seem like quite uh, extreme length. So he got invited to be, uh, to put an entry into who's who. Um, and uh, he decided, I remember this as a child, that this was absolutely, a t would be a terrible thing 
to do because it was an elitist publication and he would find himself in terrible company, uh, something I might understand. Um, now, he had an ambivalent relationship with the LSE and he had an even more ambivalent relationship uh, with the Labour Party. Uh, people will know that Parliamentary Socialism, his most famous uh, book, argued that the Labour Party could not be a vehicle for socialism. Some people might say that his sons are now proving him right. <laughs> but, but, the, but, but the best thing about him as a political influence uh, was that while he had huge problems with Labour politics and he expressed outrage at many decisions of its leaders and no doubt uh, would have continued uh, to do so, he never had contempt for the process of trying to use it uh, to make people's lives better and make Britain a more progressive place. This is why he was a political lodestar for me. Uh, and that, when I say the word lodestar, I mean a point in the orbit not always to follow, uh, but from which to navigate. And that's obviously one of the many reasons why I miss him so much. Uh, he had a profound belief, and this is something that has stayed with me and I think David, he had a profound belief in the ability of politics to change things. And also, and this is not always common, I think, on the left, an optimism uh, about left politics and, and left politics being successful not based on laws of historical materialism, though he probably did believe them, but based on people and what people could achieve. Now, I think when it comes to the issue of climate change, it seems to me that those attributes, faith in politics, optimism, uh, and belief in people are very important commodities. And that's really where I want to uh, start uh, my talk tonight. And I want to to start off by talking about Copenhagen, but then I want to move beyond Copenhagen quite quickly. But let me start there, because it's obviously uh, an absolutely crucial moment. And I think there is no doubt that, and people have been following this, it remains a very big challenge to get a strong deal and a strong agreement at Copenhagen. I personally think it is absolutely essential uh, that we do, because with the world has set a deadline. It is a deadline which I think has had a forcing effect on different countries around the world. In the last week alone, we've seen from South Korea, from Brazil, from Russia, pledges and promises in relation to climate change. That's because the deadline has focused minds and has forced action. And in a sense, I think one thing that is important in this debate, there is gonna be lots of doom and gloom in the next three weeks in the run up to Copenhagen. Uh, I think we have to be very careful not to su succumb to the doom-mongering because I still think that a comprehensive agreement at Copenhagen, and we may get into this in questions, is absolutely uh, doable uh, as well as being absolutely necessary. And when I say a comprehensive agreement, I mean one that covers all the major issues of how we reduce emissions, who pays for it, how we counter deforestation, how we have a legally binding agreement, all the major issues. And I'm confident that we can get, or I'm optimistic that we can get, uh, an agreement that is consistent uh, with the science. And the science is very clear that the minimum we need to do is to limit uh, dangerous climate change, that limit temperature rises to more than, to no more than two degrees. One thing just to say is, people will think in the next few weeks, well, what is, the, what is Copenhagen all about fundamentally? I think the most important thing, the biggest test I set for Copenhagen is can we do what the world has never done before which is to reverse the inexorable rise in global emissions. In other words, can we show out of Copenhagen that emissions will start falling, not rising, by about 2020 at the latest? And that would be a massive achievement. And that's why we need a Copenhagen deal that involves all countries, not just Europe, but the United States, which obviously Kyoto didn't have, but also developing uh, countries. And that is the big challenge of Copenhagen, it seems to me. And that is what my, apart from this lecture, that is what my singular uh, focus is going to be in the next few weeks, getting the most ambitious agreement that we can. But the next challenge, and this is what I want to talk about and mainly discuss tonight, is that after Copenhagen, the work of implementing an agreement will begin. And we need to implement, and this is the scale of the challenge that we face, we need to implement what is agreed at Copenhagen, not just in one country, as I said, but in every country, in democracies and in dictatorships, in richer countries and in poor countries, in energy exporters and energy importers, 
not just for a year or two, but for decades. Now, when I've thought historically about is there any other issue the world has faced where it has established this sort of consensus, I personally can't think of uh, an issue. That is the scale of the challenge we face. And I say that not to inspire pessimism, but just to give a sense of the scale of the challenge uh, uh, that we are talking about. Now, the question uh, then is not simply what kind of policies do we need, and that's not really going to be my focus tonight, not simply what kind of policies do we need to make this happen, to not only get an agreement at Copenhagen, but beyond that, to implement it and hold fast to it. It's not a question of policy as much, in my view, as a question of politics. And so my focus tonight is what you might call the grammar of politics and how it needs to change. And this is the argument I want to uh, make. Uh, first of all, that the challenge of climate change is so great that we are all transition economies, and I use the word advisedly. The low-carbon challenge is such that our system of economic production and the way we go about our daily lives will have to alter profoundly. Secondly, to secure that change, we need not just to change a set of policies, as I said, but to adapt our politics. And in particular, I want to argue that what you might call the politics of now finds its limits in climate change. The politics of now is about an offer to people to provide immediate improvements in their lives. It is the dominant part of the terms of trade of modern politics, and actually, I will argue, an important part of progressive politics. But I suppose I want to argue and acknowledge a difficult truth, which is that when it comes to climate change, the politics of now is not enough. So we need to fashion something that goes beyond it, what you might call the politics of the common good, a phrase used recently by another Miliband lecturer, Michael Sandel. And I want to argue uh, what this politics of the common good might be. And this is, as I said to David when I saw him earlier, this is a work in progress and we, something we should discuss. To my mind, there are four elements of this politics of the common good. First of all, a politics that goes beyond the satisfaction of immediate wishes to treat citizens as citizens, speaking honestly about the tough choices that we face. Uh, secondly, a politics that has at, at its heart not only the consumer of today, not even the citizen during their own lifetime, but looks to future generations and intergenerational justice. Thirdly, a politics that does recognize that self-interest in a broad sense is a powerful, important, and empowering motivator. And fourthly, a politics that appeals to a sense of idealism about what is fair here and around the world. And that's the argument I want to make. Let me say something more about the scale of the challenge. If we are to tackle climate change in the years after Copenhagen, it is clear that we will need to secure change on an unprecedented scale. I want to say something about that very briefly. In the UK, we've pledged to cut carbon emissions by 80%. That means we need our electricity and our transport systems and our homes to be near zero carbon. So we need a dramatic increase, for example, in renewable energy. People have seen how difficult that is. We're planning for a six-fold increase by 2020. We need to dramatically change the nature of our homes, our transport sector. And this is, in a way, one of the bigger challenges. We probably need the amount of electricity and power we generate to go up, not down, as we move to electric cars, electrification of rail, all kinds of other things. And we need these changes to happen quickly. And the change needs to be permanent. I personally think, although people talk about being on a war footing, I personally think that we have to be aware that this change is not simply going to be about us living in exceptional times somehow. It's not going to be that we make the change and then we can somehow go back to business as usual. In fact, we need low carbon to become precisely unexceptional. Now, I think that without social acceptance for this, support for policy won't endure in the way it needs to. To make these changes clearly requires leadership from government, but it also requires us to build and maintain consent. And to take that consent for granted is, in my view, a mistake. And to assume we can sustain change without it would be wrong as well. So the change and the scale of change we need is enormous. We need to secure consent, continuing consent for that change. The question is what kind of politics we need to make that happen. Now, I talked a bit earlier about the politics of now, and I just want to say something more about it. 
the politics of now, at its best, is about pe meeting people's immediate needs and improving people's lives in ways which markets alone cannot do. Appeals to self-interest were at the core of many of the great progressive movements, social movements of the 20th century, from pensions to the NHS, and will be at the core of many social movements of the 21st century. Politics is about improving the lives of people, and therefore is not, there is nothing wrong with politics that appeals to people's self-interest. I've seen it in my own constituency in the last decade, from tax credits to sure start. But climate change poses a challenge to the politics of now, because it is a challenge marked by distance. This is something that Tony Giddens talks about very eloquently uh, in his book. I think there are three types of distance involved in the politics of climate change. First, temporal distance. The politics of now looks for quick wins. When it comes to climate change, the very difficult truth is there is a very significant time lag between when we act and when we see the consequences of those actions. The carbon emitted at any point in time has effects for decades to come. Just one way of illustrating this, we've seen global warming of 0.8 degrees so far. Actually, the carbon that has now been, the world has emitted in the past few decades will mean we see warming of 1.4 degrees. There's not much we can do about it. Now, what does that mean for the decisions we make now and in the future? It actually means, and we, our climate impact projections, which came out earlier this year, illustrated this. The decisions we take at Copenhagen will have their biggest effects not today, not next year, not in a decade's time, but in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time. So we are making decisions now which are explicitly going to benefit future generations. And this time lag creates an, a sort of distance between the generation that needs to act and the generation that feels the greatest benefit. It is for good reason that some young people, and actually two of them are in the audience, uh, wear T-shirts saying, how old will you be in 2050? 79, I think, in my case. Um, so there's an issue of temporal distance. Secondly, there's an issue of geographical distance, which is right to be uh, honest about. The people who are most vulnerable to climate change, and it is already happening, are people who live a long way from these shores. They're not in our neighborhoods or our country or even our continent. Now that emphasizes to me the sort of moral case and politics we saw in the government's advocacy of international debt relief. Thirdly, there is the issue of causal distance. The nature of the threat is enormous. It's the sort of thing you might see in a Hollywood movie, but Again, we need to be honest about this. It is hard to link the specific actions we take as individuals with this monumental scale of problem and to believe we can really have an effect. So there are three different types of issue of distance that we face in relation uh, to the challenge of climate change. And here's what makes it even harder. If the impacts of the problem are distant, the costs of tackling it are immediate. Lord Stern, who's done so much to change the climate change debate in Britain and around the world, is uh, in the audience. And his report showed that in the long run, it is less costly to tackle climate change uh, than to fail uh, to do so. In other words, the costs of inaction are greater than the costs of action. But the costs of action are still costs. They have significant upfront costs. Even after making it easier for people to lead a low-carbon lifestyle, which I think is important, there remain hard choices which cannot just be tackled by politics of now. And they are hard choices about energy bills, about where you put wind farms, dare I say it, where you put nuclear power stations, a whole set of hard choices which don't lend themselves to the politics of now. <coughs> hard choices too, by the way, about industries which are reliant on high carbon and how and whether they can adapt. So the challenge is enormous, and we need to move as quickly as we can 
uh, to tackle it, not just here and around the world. The nature of uh, the challenge poses a very big uh, challenge to our way of doing uh, politics, or the dominant way in which we do politics. And the question is then, uh, what follows? And this is where I get to my work in progress. I said at the outset we need to move from a politics of now to a politics of the common good, Michael Sandel's phrase, which treats people not simply as consumers but as citizens. Now, what does this uh, require? I just want to briefly talk about the things I think that it makes necessary. First of all, it seems to me the absolute precondition of this different kind of politics is to take the argument to people about the tough decisions involved in tackling climate change. This is the starting point, a willingness to engage with people on, for example, the fact that to deal with the problem of climate change, energy bills are going to rise. Now, that is very difficult in the culture of politics that we have. I presented the low-carbon transition plan, our low-carbon transition plan, in July, and I was doing interviews with... Uh, I was first interview was on the Today programme, and the interviewer said to me, well, come on, you know, be honest, the energy bills are going to have to rise, aren't they? And I said, yeah, they are. And they were sort of the end of the interview because that wasn't what normally happened in the interviews on the Today programme. And in a sense, that sort of sums up the different kind of paradigm uh, that we have to uh, uh, think uh, in. And it's not just about energy bills. I've already referred to the kind of cha challenges we have about building a new low-carbon infrastructure, which are enormous. We've got to build something like 10,000 wind turbines by 2020. Not personally, but uh, as a country, we've got to build 10,000 wind turbines. That is an enormous challenge in a, in a small island. You know, and just to give you a sense of the difficulty, uh, this chap put forward a bill in Parliament saying we should limit the... We should, mean, we should have a system whereby no one is within two kilometres of a uh, wind turbine. And no houses, I think, within, and, and it wipes out something like 75% of the places you could put any onshore wind turbines. So these are difficult decisions that we have to make as a country, and they're, and they, and I suppose my first point of this policy to the common good is you've got to be blunt with people about uh, these uh, challenges. I think the related point, though, is that you've got to convince people that you have fairness in the. Uh, where you are approaching these decisions. In relation to energy bills, and again, I think there is much further we have to go in, in this, energy bills are going to rise, but we've got to make it fairer th than it is so far. Because otherwise, you won't carry people uh, with you. And we're trying to do that. We're having tougher regulation and other things. But I think personally that there is, there is further to go uh, to carry people with you uh, in relation to that challenge, and it does argue very strongly for a, a, an absolutely central role for the state in making uh, that happen. I also think you need fairness of procedure, if you like. So when it comes to the question of where do you cite these wind turbines, something I've been talking about in the last uh, couple of weeks, we have to find a way of convincing people that their voice has been heard. That doesn't mean to say that people are just going to get their own way when they say, I don't want a wind turbine uh, near me. But we have to find a way in which people get a sense of a sort of procedural fairness in, in the decision-making uh, that is made. So the first point I'm making is that the launching off point for this politics of the common good in relation to climate change is confronting people with the difficult choices. The second aspect of the politics of the common good must be to focus uh, on intergenerational justice. I said that at the beginning. I think it's a banality in a way, but it is worth just thinking through the extent to which most of the issues we deal with in politics are not uh, intergenerational, or many of them are not intergenerational. Healthcare, policing, these are many issues which actually it's rarely about what generations in three or four generations' time are going to be uh, thinking. It is about now. And climate change is obviously not like that. It is, as I've argued, it is a completely distinct if we only live for today, and I was having this discussion with some of my colleagues before um, uh, this speech, if you had a thought experiment about somehow a meteorite hitting Britain uh, in 2050 and life being wiped out, I don't think it's the case that you'd be thinking climate change was the biggest single priority, but you might still be thinking that the health service was a big priority. That emphasizes the intergenerational and the long-term nature 
of this question. And it's quite an existential question, actually, <coughs> about the human race and its uh, uh, wish for future generations to have a, a particular kind of life. Now, Nick Stern has thought a lot about this, and in his Stern report, indeed, uh, did adjust what they call the economists call the discount rate uh, in relation to, uh, to climate change, because conventional discount rates... This is why I was never very good at my master's in economics. But anyway, conventional discount rates uh, don't give uh, proper credit uh, or any really pay any attention to what might happen in 200 years' time. And that is an inadequate approach when it comes to climate change. Now, the question is, how do you give effect to this belief in long-termism? David's written a paper about this, actually, which unfortunately I didn't realize until I'd arrived at this lecture, but he'll tell us in questions what his conclusions are. My conclusions about this are that you need to find ways in which you institutionalize the rights of future generations. So take the legal obligation in Britain to 80% reductions in carbon emissions. I mean, that is, in a sense, binding the hands, at least for the next 30 or 40 years, of current generations to protect the rights, that's a decision we've made as a society, to protect the rights of future um, uh, generations. And that's why we've, we, we've, uh, we've done that and we've got independent voices uh, uh, making sure that we do so. Of course, the problem about climate change is it is intrinsically a global problem. We are 2% of emissions. I referred earlier uh, to Copenhagen. And in a sense, I suppose, Part of the argument we have to make about protecting future generations is precisely arguing for the multilateralism of the UN process in relation to Copenhagen and climate change. Because there's absolutely no way you can do this. The UN process is a very uh, frustrating process, as I've learned over the last year, but it is the best process that we've got. Because you can only do this with global cooperation. And global cooperation on a scale never seen before, as I emphasized um, at the uh, at the opening of this lecture. There is no room for free riders uh, when it comes to this challenge. So the second point that I want to argue is that we need to embed an approach to intergenerational uh, justice. Simon Caney, a philosopher, uh, has suggested that we should have a committee of government, which is an interesting idea, which is charged with sort of thinking about a set of people 100 years hence and thinking, well, what kind of policy would you be demanding now? But, but, so that's my, but that's my second argument. The third element of this politics of the common good, and this is a paradox, or might seem like a paradox, is that actually I think self-interest is an important part of it. Because the truth is, and I mentioned this earlier, that an appeal to self-interest has been an important thread in thinking on the left since, it started, since the movement uh, started. It was self-interest that first motivated the trade unions, and it's self-interest that has motivated lots of political uh, movements. And I said earlier, and this is not a politician's get out, I promise you, I said earlier there are lots of hard choices, but not everything is a hard choice and a negative. And in a sense, I think there's another lesson here for the, both the green movement and government about the way we talk about this issue. It came home to me when I was uh, banging on about the environmental dangers of climate change, which I do think are very important, don't get me wrong. And a Labour Party member, and Labour Party members always have infinite wisdom, a Labour, Party, a Labour Party member said to me, look, Ed, he said, you've got to remember, Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. And, <laughs> and actually, he was saying something quite important, I think, which is, you've got to talk about the positive aspects of this low-carbon uh, revolution and the changes that we can see in our uh, society. And that is about jobs and the kind of green jobs we can create in this country. It is about energy security. It is about fairness. It is about a whole range of issues. And it is about, and this is going to be my fourth point, but it is about taking the opportunity of the low carbon revolution to change the way we think about our society and to remake our society. And that seems to me to be uh, fundamental to taking people with you. But I suppose my third point is self-interest is part of this politics of the common good. We have to argue the positive case for tackling climate change and what it can do for our country. And just to illustrate that in just in a very small microcosm, someone was telling me earlier on today that a particular 
the World Business Organization, who had come to them and said, look, it is so important for us that we get a positive outcome out of Copenhagen because of the message it will send to investors about whether they invest in green jobs uh, or they don't. And that is why the economic case for Copenhagen is as strong, in my view, or is a strong case, um, almost as strong as the environmental case, because if the world sends a very clear signal that it is making a decisive move to low carbon, it will have a profound effect on the investments that businesses and others are willing um, to make. So my third argument is that self-interest is part of this politics of the common good. But the fourth, and in a way the most important part of this, is uh, about our idealism. Because even after we've done all we can to build public support through candor and uh, being candid about the challenges, institutionalized intergenerational equity, spoken to people's self-interest, there will still be work to do to inspire people. It is in that space, after the work of self-interest is done, that we cannot live uh, without ideals. We need a politics of climate change that speaks to people's idealism as well as to their wallets, and it must chime with people's ideal of the good society. And the most important ideal is social justice. We don't just need to preserve our world for future generations, we need to hand over a fairer world. And that is true domestically and internationally. And in a sense, this is why the financial part of Copenhagen is, for me, so fundamental. Because the people most at risk uh, of climate change are the people that I met in Bangladesh, who live on the sandbanks uh, of Bangladesh. And actually, while the decisions we make on climate change and cutting our emissions today will only have an effect in 30 or 40 years, the decisions we make on adaptation and finance for adaptation for poor countries will have a profound effect on those people's lives and could be the difference between uh, life uh, and death for them. And if it's true internationally, it's true domestically um, as well, that we need to show that in this transition, we can improve people's quality of life and make our society uh, more just. So, uh, I think that we can argue for a politics of the common good in relation to climate change. I don't think the politics of now uh, takes us uh, where we need uh, to get to. And I think there are four parts of that as I uh, tried to uh, set out. Let me uh, end by saying a couple of other things. First of all, I actually think this politics of the common good, based on self-interest but going beyond it, looking at the needs of future generations and appealing to people's ideals, is something which chimes with the public more than we might think. Because people are concerned not just about their children, but their children's children. And people do want a more just uh, society. And actually, it doesn't just apply to climate change. Because many of the issues that we face, social care and pensions, poverty and social mobility, a whole range of issues require this different sort of politics, in my view. Now, and this is the point I want to end on, politicians have an absolutely crucial role, it seems to me, in building this uh, sort of politics. But one of the things I did learn from my dad was that people demanding change is, in the end, the thing that makes the biggest difference. Political leaders are crucial, but change really happens, and we've seen this throughout our history, the suffragettes, the anti-apartheid movement, gay rights, the Berlin Wall, all, all kinds of changes that we've seen. They only happen because people demanded that they happen. And this is going to be true in relation to climate change. And this is not me saying oh, it's all up to you, but it is me saying that actually the role that the Green Movement has played in this country I think has been crucial in changing opinion. Politicians do think deeply about what the Green Movement is saying and is likely to say, because there is a substantial proportion, a minority, but a substantial proportion of the electorate uh, who listen to what they uh, have to say. And I think that movement is going to face big challenges uh, in the years ahead, because it will have to reach out, and I suspect we'll get into this in questions, to a wider constituency than it has so far managed to build if it is to help to build this consensus that I think that we need. But it is, and the role of people 
is fundamental to tackling the challenges that I've set out. And it's in that context that I want to leave the last words of my lecture for my dad uh, and a passage at the end of his uh, last book, Socialism for a Skeptical Age. Uh, and he said, he wrote this, in all countries there are people in numbers large and small who are moved by the vision of a new social order. It is in, their growth, it is in the growth in their numbers and in the success of their struggles that lies the best hope for humankind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed, and thank you for that uh, profoundly optimistic and uh, uh, carefully crafted defense of the possibilities of Copenhagen and afterwards. I mean, I'm sure many of us will have questions to and want to press you on some of the detail, but there are a lot of people here in the audience who are themselves major contributors to the debate on climate change and slightly breaking with custom. Before I ask the audience in general whether they wish to... Um, come in with questions. I just want to ask perhaps one or two of the participants in the debate about climate change here, for instance, Tony Giddens, among others, whether they want to start with any particular issues. Tony? Tony Giddens. Yeah, coming up. Um, first, let me say, Ed, um, we don't want some mutual admiration society, but I think we've done a great job since you became minister. Um, you didn't talk much about, you know, the consequence of Copenhagen itself. Can you just say something about what kinds of compliance mechanisms do you think either exist or can be set up to make sure that states that do sign up to targets are shown to meet those targets? Because, you know, it seems to me that... You know, there's a lot of discussion of climate change and innovation on the level of technology. But my view is, I think a bit like yours, really, that we're going to need a lot of creativity on the level of politics, on the level of social innovation, but also in the system of international relations. Because famously, there, there are very few sanctioning mechanisms in the international system. And why the United Nations, I think, has done a wonderful job of of stimulating global consciousness around climate change. We all know that it tends to be paralyzed around the Security Council, which is where the most important and powerful decisions tend to be taken. Thank you very much. Anyone else who's written extensively on this debate who would like to seize the moment before we go to the audience in general, may I just add something to Tony's comment about binding agreements and how you can Create by maybe, you can, maybe you can answer his question. No, no, yeah. it, it's, 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 you are, you are, you are, you know. I think rightly, you know, very passionate and optimistic now going forward to Copenhagen. But a lot of politicians across the world have sent out rather um, downcast, more pessimistic messages in the last few weeks, in order to ensure that expectations around Copenhagen are not too high. It's at least two stumbling blocks, it seems. One is a lot of developing countries don't want to commit to binding targets, nor does the U.S. Senate particularly want to commit to deep binding targets. I wonder whether you think in this context that the road to Copenhagen presents exactly the kind of anticipation of the problems Tony Giddens is, uh, uh, is referring to, and the road after it raises yet again this issue of how you can lock these countries into some kind of common good politics, but around binding common agreements. Should we, do you want to start with that? And, uh, uh, if, you, if you want me to. Uh, and then we'll uh, to let me, uh, these are two very difficult questions. Let, let me deal with yours first, in the sense that that's pre-Copenhagen, and then Tony's uh, after, because that's, sort of, in a sense, post. I personally have been trying to raise expectations uh, throughout the last year because I think it's been very important to raise the stakes. I think it's the case that the world set a deadline in Bali two years ago and it's not going to get any easier uh, to tackle this. And actually, I think this is a unique alignment of the stars that we have because, let's be honest, the US has been one of the biggest stumbling blocks in relation to climate change. But you've got a new president who's in his first year in office. It's not going to get easier, in my view, for him. Uh, and that's why you've got to seize the moment. Um, 
And that's why people have got a bit depressed because they think, well, we're not going to get a legally binding treaty in Copenhagen. Uh, it seems to me that the most important thing we need to do is get a very clear and comprehensive agreement in Copenhagen with a very short track, uh, at worst, a very short track to a legally binding treaty. And we do need a legally binding uh, a treaty. And you know, there are stumbling blocks on this. I think, I think the only... Uh, sort of other thing I would say, though, in relation to your question is, is that, and it maybe it slightly contradicts my, my, my lecture or parts of it, is that I think getting, getting on the road and actually starting to reduce emissions, I hope, will create some reinforcing sort of mechanisms and actions. Because once people start to do this, and all countries start to do it, I think you're more in business than when you've got a very partial situation where only some countries are even, even sort of in the, in the game. So I think you've got to get everyone in the game. As for developing countries, I think developing countries have come a huge distance in the last year. A huge distance. I mean, it is, you can underestimate this, but the Chinese president went to the UN, the first ever speech by a Chinese president to the UN, and said not it's all developed countries' fault, which actually he could easily have said because up to now it has been our fault. Um, he said, look, we accept our responsibility. We are going to uh, target what we call carbon intensity. So in other words, we're not going to cut our emissions yet, but we're going to slow the growth in our emissions. And frankly, the science, if Nick Stern were here, still here, he'd tell us this, uh, the science tells us we don't need China to cut its emissions before 2020. We ca what we can't afford to have is China growing its emissions uh, at, at a sort of um, unconstrained rate. So that's why I'm less, perhaps less pessimistic. And actually, the US, I think, is being pushed along. By the way, the only other thing I'd say in relation to your question, and I'll uh, move on to Tony's, is Europe is incredibly important. I mean, if you, you know, if you want to understand the case for Europe, just look at what's happening on climate change, because it is an incredibly important um, uh, counterpart, let's put it that way, to the US in these negotiations. Um, as for Tony's very difficult question about compliance, uh, let me be frank about this. There is no easy answer to this question of compliance. Kyoto does have a compliance mechanism, which hasn't yet been tested, uh, which says that uh, for every one tonne that you fail to cut, uh, you will have to have your future um, uh, targets reduced by 1.4 uh, tonnes uh, of carbon, and that's due to be tested in 2014. But, I mean, there is real sort of doubts about, um, about that mechanism and how that mechanism is going to be enforced. Tony, I don't have an easy answer to this. I think in the end, in the longer term, you're going to have to find some mechanism whereby people have to be in this game. But I think my focus, maybe it sounds a bit short term, given my lecture was about long termism, is you've got to get everyone in the game first. And it's proving so difficult to get everyone in the game that let's get people in the game. And I think then you're going to have to have a mechanism that really enforces uh, compliance. Someone in the audience might have a better answer than that. Okay, thank you. Well, um, we take questions generally in clusters of five, so it gives Ed a chance to pause and it gives you a chance to raise a lot of issues. Um, if you could keep your questions succinct, that would be very good. So we've got roaming mics. Um, let's start with the gentleman at the back there. Succinct questions, please. Um, yes. Do you think that we need to... Sorry, sorry. Do you think we need to stop our obsessive um, search for economic growth and settle for the fact that we in the West have quite enough already and uh, just settle for that and allow the rest of the world to catch up with us? Yeah, then just come forward a little bit. Yeah, Robert Faulkner is just sitting there. Thank you. Thank you. There's a huge need for aid flowing to the South to help developing countries with the need to mitigate and adapt to climate change. You've spoken about this eloquently. What are the proposals on the table that you see that could make this happen? Okay, now I'm just going up a little bit for a moment. Yeah, guy, guy there with us. Oh. Can you say yeah. their first names? Just their first yeah, can you, say your, can you just say your name before you speak in future, please? Thank you. Uh, Justin Kempley, we saw an opinion poll last week that said that the majority of the public, very sadly, uh, don't agree that climate change is man-made and happening. Uh, my question is, before we go and try and win the battle in Copenhagen, how are we going to win it at home? You outlined some of the methods here in your speech, which was admirable. Why haven't you done this to date? Why have we failed so far? Okay, okay three. I'm just having a look at the range of uh, questions. Um, 
take one more from up there, gentleman at the back. We'll, we'll, we're going to have more than one round of questions. It's gender balance. Um, yeah, it is. I'm uh, watching out for that. It's not much gender balance. Uh, Pasco Subido. Um, I was wondering, talking long term, with uh, the leadership yourself and perhaps Gordon Brown have given, how will a change of government affect the, the long termism and moving away from a politics of now, especially given the Tories' position on the EU and the need for EU leadership? Okay, that's enough questions from boys for the time being. Uh, anyone else? There's a lady there. There's yes. a lady there in the, Good. In the middle. Please. We're just, we're just going to get a mic to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Neva Cleary. I just wonder, could you comment on the future of nuclear energy in the United Kingdom and what role um, nuclear energy will play in managing energy, energy security and climate change in the future? Okay, well, that's five questions. Are you, are you okay yep. with that? Yeah, we'll, I'm absolutely then we'll fine. Come back. Um, economic growth. Uh, I, I personally think that we that the the answer to this uh, conundrum we face in relation to climate change is not to say we are uh, anti-growth, because I think if you're First point, if you're in the business of public persuasion, I think it's pretty difficult to persuade people that moving to a society of no growth uh, is going to be good for them, their living standards, and their uh, families. And all the evidence is that redistribution, for example, is much easier in a society with economic growth. So if you're someone who believes in redistribution, um, I think it's sort of pretty bad news for that. I think it's pretty bad news for uh, employment. Uh, I also think, and, I, and to be fair to you, you didn't say this in your question, I think that the, if the message to developing countries is, our solu is that our solution to uh, the climate crisis is no growth, we are completely sunk. Now, to be fair, you didn't say uh, in, uh, you were talking about developed uh, countries, but I think we, you've got to design a form of prosperity which is low-carbon prosperity, not high-carbon prosperity, and I actually think it's possible uh, to do that. On aid flows to the, uh, to the south, what are the offers on the table? This is where we have to make further progress in the next few weeks. The EU has actually staked out a position based on, really on the Gordon Brown position, which was $100 billion a year public and private finance by 2020, about half from the carbon market, a half from uh, public finance. But there needs to be international public finance. And our Prime Minister has been very clear about this, and it needs to be additional to overseas aid, because otherwise you're going to rob Peter to pay Paul, and you're going to have massive transfers from some countries to others. Um, uh, that is an incredibly tough sell, including with our counterparts in the United States. But it is absolutely necessary, in my view. I don't think you'll get a deal in Copenhagen without climate finance. Um, I'm, very, I'm very clear about that. And I don't think, actually, the developing countries will be sensible to sign up to a deal uh, at Copenhagen without climate finance. So, you know, part of my task in the next few weeks is to get other developed countries, frankly, to join the EU in pushing forward climate um, uh, uh, finance. And that needs to be for both adaptation to climate change and mitigation. Um, Justin asked his question about the science. It was a pretty depressing. Uh, it was a pretty depressing opinion poll. Look, I, I, one thing I've learned in the relation in this job is that you've got to keep remaking the case for the science, because the problem with the science is that there's always someone who can pose a an apparently robust, turns out not to be robust at all, view, um, which makes people doubt it. If I when I go on talk shows. James Whale talk show, I spent a whole time arguing with him about the science of climate change, whether it was true or not. Just for the record, ask any scientist, reputable scientist in Britain, the Met Office, uh, the Royal Society, I mean, they say th there's no doubt about this. You know, CO2 emissions, uh, atmospheric CO2 concentrations higher than for 600,000 years. The last 15 years uh, in Britain have seen nine of the ten warmest years on record. I can give you a whole stream of facts about this. I mean, there is no doubt about the science. And also, and this is a really important insight which I've learned in this job, it's not that people are predicting uh, an effect of, uh, or, or observing, rather, an effect between CO2 and temperature. I mean, it is a scientific, any scientist in the room would be able to tell me this, my physics or chemistry or whatever it is isn't good enough, but it is, an, it, is a, it is a sort of predictable consequence of higher CO2 concentrations that you have higher uh, temperatures. By the way, the other argument that I use in relation to this is that let's just say for the sake of argument, which I don't believe, that there was a 50% chance that the skeptics were right. I mean, would you really bet the future of the planet on the 50% chance that they were right? But you wouldn't send your kids on a plane flight in 30 years' time if you thought it was a 50% chance of it crashing. 
And similarly, you wouldn't bet the, the future of the planet on the chances that the sceptics are, 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 are right. Um, Pasco, your question about the Tories, what a nice invitation. Thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, look, look, the way I look at it is that um, climate change is the biggest market failure the world has ever seen. And you've got to believe that the role of government is to correct and intervene in market failure. Fundamentally, uh, I think that that is why they have a problem in relation to this. I also think you're right to say that the fact that they hang around with climate change deniers in Europe and the fact that they would spend time renegotiating the relationship in Europe uh, is, uh, you know, is going to be a, of no help, indeed, of hindrance uh, uh, to this. Um, nuclear energy... Uh, my mother will testify I didn't grow up in a pro-nuclear uh, energy household. Um, uh, uh, I've, I've uh, come to the view that nuclear energy does need to be part of the low-carbon future because the challenge of climate change is so enormous. Um, we have, as I, and I mentioned this, incredibly challenging targets on renewable energy, p targets that some people doubt that we can uh, achieve. Personally, I think we can achieve them. We have, we have incredibly challenging targets, but the truth is the low carbon energy of the future can't just come from renewables because of intermittency of wind and all kinds of other things. So I think nuclear can play a role, and that's what we've said, uh, and does need to play a role in our energy mix. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we're around, round two, um, just looking gender at the balance. range of, yes, gender balance. Gender and exactly. age balance. We'll come back to you boys later. And the, and the yeah. older people. Yeah. 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 Just one down here first, and then you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Just say who you are. Yes, my name is Kirsty, and in the year 2050, I will be 66 years old. Thank you for letting us know, Ed, how old you'll be. I was really encouraged to hear your point, too, about the politics of um, the common good, and in particular, intergenerational justice. And I'd be interested to hear what your examples of um, institutionalizing the rights of future generation would be. Um, and maybe just to touch on one in particular, and that is looking at the role that young people can have, not only in implementing a Copenhagen Agreement in the future, but what role we can have in being part of the UK delegation, for example, on the pre-Copenhagen, during Copenhagen, and after Copenhagen process. Thank you. Um, my name's Cecilia Lischka. Um, I also Up liked um, your vision um, yeah. of the politics for the common good, but I wonder if it's possibly a little bit optimistic and ambitious at the moment, and if that's what's actually going to be needed to tackle climate change, because surely it doesn't just depend on um, the politics of, um, or the current politics at the moment, um, and it will change you know, in, in the future in, in, around, the, around the world. Um, does climate change need to be taken out of politics and be left to an organisation such as the IPCC, where politics doesn't play such a, such a role? Thank you. Guy at the back, and then the microphone at the top with the... Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, quite recently... At Just say who you are. Yeah. Oh, sorry, my name's Teddy Nicholson. Um, quite recently at the LSC, we had a lecture by Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner, the authors of oh. the book Freakonomics. Yeah. Um, and they've been arguing recently uh, that, the, that if we are serious about climate change, we need to start looking at geoengineering. Do you agree? Uh, my name is Victor, and uh, I would like to hear your comment on the claims that uh, the current way of thinking about climate change actually promotes uh, exhaust pipe thinking in the sense that uh, we think more about how to reduce negative consequences than changing uh, the processes in a way that they don't produce such negative consequences. Thank you. Hi there, Andrew Hickman from The Ecologist. I was wondering if you could comment on the effects that biofuels uh, and the biofuel industry is having on places such as Papua, Indonesia, uh, and whether you could answer the question, are biofuels doing more harm than good? That's fine, but I'll just take one more. This lady in the third row from the front, and then we'll give the floor back to you. And, but we'll ha there'll be one more, at least one more round. Thank you, Jane Wyatt. Um, I wonder how you would convince uh, people on low and fixed incomes that uh, moving towards a low carbon lifestyle is not actually just. Good question. All good questions. Um, right. Uh, intergenerational justice. Um, I would love to say, yes, you can definitely come on our delegation to Copenhagen. Um, we will t t talk to me afterwards about what we can do uh, about um, 
Copenhagen. I think I've promised to meet you in Copenhagen, um, uh, and I will keep my promise. Uh, look, I think on this thing about how do you entrench the longer term process, I, I, I said my lecture was a work in progress, and I think this is genu that's genuinely the case, because I think that, uh, I, I think it relates to the, ladies, the second question that the lady asked, which is, I do think that politicians have to make big sort of weighing up decisions uh, about our society and balancing different interests. But I think having independent organizations who keep our feet to the fire seems to me to be incredibly important. The role that Adair Turner and his uh, Climate Change Committee play is incredibly important um, in this because they are fearless, they are, I, I think it's fair to say, expansive uh, in their interpretation of their uh, remit. Uh, and in a way, that is a very good thing because it means that not just this government, but future governments um, will be faced with the, with the um, consequences and, and the sort of reality um, of that. Uh, I'm sure there must be other ways, and this is sort of, as I say, it's a work in progress, about how you institutionalize um, uh, uh, this thinking. I think involving young people in policy making is, is a part of it, is a very important um, uh, part of it. Uh, the next... I'm having trouble reading my own writing. Uh, the ne I think the next question was about taking this, taking things out of uh, um, politics. Did you write down the questions? I didn't actually. Oh right, okay. Uh, I think uh, I think it was about um, uh, about about sort of whether we should whether we should um, take this out of politics. I suppose I've tried to answer that by saying, look, I think politicians need to be responsible for big decisions in our society, and I think making this all the responsibility of the experts is not going to work wouldn't be the right thing to do democratically, but I think checks and balances are important and constraints on politicians are important as well to keep them honest, if, you, uh, if I can put it um, uh, that way. Uh, Victor asked about exhaust pipe thinking, which I've, is a phrase I've not heard um, uh, before. I think what you were saying was, isn't technology, if I interpret you correctly, isn't technology a big answer to this? Now, um, I, I think that Technology is part of the answer to it, but I don't think we can just rely on technology, not least because this was George W. Bush's solution, but I, I, don't, I, I don't think that technology on its own is enough. So, for example, you know, we need to treat energy like it is a scarce and precious uh, commodity, because it is. And you know, the, the best form of uh, energy security, uh, low-carbon energy, is not using the energy, frankly. That is the, the surest way uh, to, to, to tackling the problem. So uh, I think that technology is important, but I think to reduce this to technology, I, I don't think is actually the answer uh, to this. Biofuels, the, the question from the ecologist, uh, you may think this is a cop-out. I don't think you can just answer a generalised question about are they do they more harm than good, because it all depends, as you will know better than I do, on the kind of biofuels you're talking about, what the impact is. It's right to say that in the EU 2020 package agreed in December, we had very strict a very strict uh, framework on the impact on indirect land use. Uh, and it's something I talked about when I was in Brazil um, with, with people there. So I think it all depends on the type of biofuels we're, t we're talking about and the impact um, uh, uh, they have. Uh, and some will, have, will not have harmful effects uh, and some uh, will. The, the question about uh, low income is really good that you asked this question because I think it is a fundamental thing that I think about a lot, particularly given the constituency I represent. You know, the first and most important thing you've got to do is you've got to find ways through your energy bills and everything, but more generally of making your society fairer because it's the only way you can carry people with you legitimately uh, on this. Um, and you know, lots of people in my constituency struggle on low incomes and some of that is about it needs to be answered through the kind of measures we take on energy and low carbon, but some of it needs to be answered in other ways um, as well. So the, the sort of first base to persuading them, I think, uh, is to strive for greater fairness in our uh, society. There's one question I missed out. Would the person who, whose question I missed out just... Yeah. He's at the back there. Yeah, sorry, what was your question? Yeah, go on. Here's the mic. 
Oh, yeah, geoengineering. Um, t uh, I think geoengineering is a total blind alley. And I think those two people who wrote that book, I mean, I think they've done a lot of harm in this debate, frankly. Um, and they've obviously, maybe they've sold lots of copies of their book, but I mean, I don't think they know anything about the science of climate change, as I understand it. And maybe they were willfully misinterpreted. But, you know, I, I confess I haven't read their chapter, but the way it was interpreted was somehow saying, oh, people have got it wrong around uh, uh, climate change. And I think the Royal Society's done a report on geoengineering. I, I think geoengineering is just a, you know, it is a sort of wing and a prayer. Um, and and I, don't, I really don't think it's, it's fine for people to do research on it, but I think if we put our hopes on geoengineering, we are in real trouble, personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as okay. long as you'd like to. All right. Yeah. Guy with a stripy shirt at the back there. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my name is Rodolfo Valente, and my question is, um, in 2005, uh, the United Nations uh, reform talks, uh, the, the European Union was uh, proposing the idea of reforming the United Nations Environment Program and making it uh, the United Nations Environment Organization. It was uh, an, an idea proposed by France and, 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 and the UK was on top of it. But uh, uh, Mr. Bolton, uh, the US ambassador, uh, vetoed it. And at, at the outcome, uh, it didn't happen. But now he's gone. Uh, is the UK still proposing the idea? Thank you. Yes, yeah, just two down. Just pass it on whilst it's there, and then we'll come up. Uh, hello, Rachel Spring, BBC News. Um, can I ask you about... A bit louder. Can you hold the mic a bit? Uh, can I ask you about Obama? Um, you mentioned that the US were... A, a Sorry, you're going to have to hold the mic closer to you. Uh, you mentioned that the US were a big stumbling block. Do you think Obama will come and what, in terms of numbers, do you think he'll need to offer in terms of cuts and baseline and money in order to secure a deal? Okay, yes, lady at the top. Hi, um, my name is Frances Aldson. Um, your point you just made about if um, technology not being the whole answer, well, in that case, I would just uh, like a, a clearer idea from you on how exactly we're going to reduce our emissions by 80% with an expanded economy which involves higher levels of consumption. And aren't we trying to have it all rather than actually make tough choices? Um, and related to that is if our need is for a low-carbon economy and low-carbon growth and to increase public awareness, why in the Queen's speech yesterday was the talk just about sustained economic growth rather than sustained low-carbon economic growth? Thank you. Could you just pass the, the mic to the gentleman with the beard? Yeah. yeah. Just say who you are and keep it short, please. Mark Sloboda, um, you've discussed uh, decarbonizing the framework of our economies, but to double up, you haven't discussed the decarbonizing the meat of our economies, consumption. We live on societies with disposable consumption of consumer goods and social relations of uh, conspicuous consumerism. How do we decarbonize consumption? What's your answer, Mark? Socialism. Right, okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes, the lady at the back had a hand up. Very somewhat at the very back. Yes, you. Yeah, we'll take it. Mike straight to the top. Yeah, yeah, my puppy. Almost like. Okay. Okay. Um, I saw a lecture at LC a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying the man speaking was from Oxford. He was very critical of the Stern report and was, you know, saying things about how, like, you know. Europe says that they're cutting emissions, but really they're just transferring their production to China, which actually, when you include the transport costs and everything, increases your footprint. Um, just lots of things about how, you know, we act like we're cutting our emissions and politicians may be, want to be seen to be doing something, but, you know, to keep a economy going in the way it's going, you'd have to profoundly change it in ways that I don't think we're ready to. How, how would you respond to that? Did you hear that? Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's five questions. I think we'll have time for one more cluster of five. Can I just, just tossing yeah. one thought. But there's, a, there's a word missing in the discussion so far, which is the T word, taxation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the issue that Robert Faulkner raised about how you raise large sums of money that are going to operate to help the transfer of technology and other things sure. to the world's poorer countries. Recently, the issue of an international tax has mm -hmm. been put back on the table, interestingly by Angela Merkel, among others, on the grounds that the financial markets ought to bear the cost of the damage that they have created uh, uh, through the credit crunch and beyond. Now, so the issue of international tax is back on the agenda. Surely, 
there is a question of carbon taxation, taxing the gross emitters that generates, potentially generates resources which are available on a, 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 to meet the issues that were, were, were raised earlier. I just wonder what your, your position is on this, whether it's an international tax mechanism of some kind or a more nationally based tax mechanism. Okay. Um, Rudolf asked about the uh, UN uh, World Environment Organization. President Sarkozy has made this proposal, just for people to people know, for a new World Environment Organization. I am less sort of associated with the, uh, or less experienced when it comes to the UN than others. Many people think that the prospect of setting up a new UN organization fills them with some reticence, shall we, uh, shall I put it that way. Um, Personally, I think we are going to need uh, 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 something which I think probably will grow out of the UNFCCC, which is the thing that governs the talks, if you like, um, uh, the UN framework on uh, climate change. Um, and uh, I, whether that's a world environmental organization or another organization, I'm not sure. Certainly, we have said that the, in, in relation to the question of finance, which I think in a way is one of the most material questions that we have, that it needs to be under the authority, not of the World Bank, but of a UN organization because of the issues of governance uh, and of having a fair voice for developing countries. And I think that's very important. And actually, one thing that people haven't really focused on is that the US uh, is in a different place on that now than they were a year ago, uh, certainly under the previous regime, and are much more open to the idea of a different governance uh, structure and and something under the authority of the uh, uh, of, of the UN, um, BBC News. Um, you get around um, uh, uh, the question about President Obama. I, I think it would be good if President Obama went to um, uh, Copenhagen. Uh, I think personally, I think he will go actually, um, and he's said he's sort of thinking about it. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, I think it would be a good idea. Um, in the end, my experience of this, we, were, we had long negotiations in the spring about whether the world would sign up to a target to avoid uh, temperature rises of more than two degrees. Frankly, people at my level got a certain distance, but when the leaders arrived, they signed up to it. So leaders m can put into place the, the final piece of the jigsaw, so I think it's important he does go. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not going to give you from the platform a target for the U.S. I think they need to sh they need to show real ambition in relation to their uh, midterm targets, and that's what I've been saying. And um, they, they are starting late uh, compared to other countries, but they need, need to show real ambition. Um, on the uh, question from uh, the next question is about technology. Reducing emissions. How am I going? How are we going to reduce emissions um, by uh, 80%? Look, this is incredibly difficult. We've set out a roadmap to 2020 for who asked? Where is the person? Yeah, we've set out a roadmap to 2020 about how we're going to reduce our emissions by 34%. And we've gone through sector by sector, from agriculture to the power sector, about how we're to transport, how we're going to do it. And we're going to do the same thing in, in a broader brush way for obvious reasons uh, in the spring for 2020, 2050. Um, it means, for example, that you're going to have to get into near, near zero energy uh, in terms of carbon. You're going to have to get to near zero in terms of your household sector. Since 80% of, of the houses that uh, are standing in 2050 have already been built, that is a massive challenge. So you've got to go through it sector by sector um, and do it. And you're right to say that it is going to be harder because of economic growth. As I said to the questioner earlier, I think ruling out economic growth is not going to persuade people. I don't think it's the right thing to do. Mark, I agree with you about socialism being, uh, uh, um, be, being the answer. Look, this issue of consumer goods is one I get a, a lot, and consumption. And I don't think that life is only about consumption. And I agree with the people who say we've got to create other ways for life to have meaning for people. And indeed, life does have meaning in other ways. I'm just also struck, though, by my own constituency experience, which is if you went then in the 1950s in Doncaster, people didn't have central heating, people didn't have washing machines, probably people, many people didn't have uh, some of the things that we would take for granted, really for granted now. People didn't have cars. Now, I find it hard to say that people's lives have got worse in respect of having those goods and to be against that kind of consumption. 
Now, you know, of course we can be sceptical about overconsumption, and of course we can be sceptical about advertising, this is the supply side, if you like, that does too much to say that life's meaning is all about consumption. But I don't think, not simply because I'm a politician who's copping out, I don't think that being anti-consumption uh, is, uh, is the answer. Uh, the, the next question was, I think, about... Um, us exporting to China, the lecture that someone had heard in Oxford saying, uh, from, from Oxford, saying that we hadn't done anything. I, I don't think that's true, but we've got to step up the pace. It's absolutely clear we've got to step up the pace. That, in a sense, the 1990 to 2009 period has been an easier period um, for us on this because of a whole range of uh, factors. Personally, I think that ch the Chinese have to re be responsible for emissions coming from China. And I think the UN framework on this is right. Because if you separate out uh, sovereignty over what happens in a country from, from responsibility, then you'll be in real trouble. Because otherwise, if we took responsibility for the goods made in China, which are coming here, what incentive do the Chinese have to do something about the nature of their factories, what happens there? But if you're saying we've got a long way to go, you're right. Uh, David, you asked about uh, carbon taxes. I think, we, I think the government has now said we're in favour of exploring the Tobin tax um, and other taxes on uh, international um, transactions. Here is the uh, question about this. The world has started off going down what you might call the, the cap and trade route. So in other words, we, uh, uh, for people to, there's a price put on carbon uh, and to, in order to emit carbon, you've got to buy permits uh, to do that. Personally, I think that has virtues because I think it does mean that you can do uh, carbon reductions in the least cost way. It makes polluters pay um, for that. The real challenge is extending that framework to the developing countries because developing countries do not want a carbon tax or a cap and trade um, system. And I don't think we're going to get that in Copenhagen. We've been trying to encourage developing countries to say in certain sectors, like the electricity sector, uh, you should have uh, uh, some kind of caps, but they're not wanting caps at the moment. Um, but I think that the world, is, the developed world, needs to move towards putting a price on carbon emissions, uh, th either through a cap and trade or a carbon tax system. We have time for one more round. Let's get the mic down here. You guys have been, uh, the three of you here have been quite patient. So let's take all three of your questions. Guy with a hat first, Woody Hat and then coming down um, forward. My name's Peter Hall. I was just wondering, given the, um, you want to have a positive spin, but there is the argument that um, we're not, we have to consider population growth, and that obviously has a rather negative um, effect on how people live their lives, but could you just at least try and say how that might be weaved into the argument in terms of having to um, reduce carbon emissions? Okay, let's bring it forward one row to the guy with... Yep, the hand up. We all just keep it short, we'll get to you more of you. Hi, my name is Matthew. Um, Mr. Miliband, I think you were you come across as quite an optimistic man. Um, you talked about the road to Copenhagen, interestingly, but um, I wanted to ask you, what if at the end of this road there's a wall? What's going to happen after? I mean, what is the sort of like worst case scenario? You talked earlier, I'll be quick, you, you talked earlier about um, Europe eventually taking the lead on this. And now that there's, you know, a, a, a president as well as a foreign affairs minister, whatever, um, I mean, what do you see, for instance, Europe to, to be? In a plan B situation? Well, yes, if, if, you know, if it really went to, you know, catastrophic kind of situation, yes. Pass it, Mike Ford. Hello, I'm Claudia. Just something about um, all the energy efficiency devices, appliance, appliances. Thank you. Okay, and the lady here. Then we'll just take the one. Yes, you, you have that. Just one second. Let's just ask the question here, and then we'll come to you. Hi, uh, my name is Maria. I was wondering how you balance uh, the need to make the right decisions for this politics of the common good, good and your um, necessity to be democratic and representative, and uh, you know address concerns and contentious issues, and the unbelievable level of public skepticism. And I'm thinking specifically of the of the nuclear power stations that have been fast tracked through the planning system. Okay, thank you. Yeah, lady with the mic now. Hi there. Uh, my name is Isabella Hayward, and I'm actually originally from Sweden, and I know that Sweden is actually trying to, um, to, to lead Europe now in, for Copenhagen. And arguably, Sweden is in a better position, both like, naturally and because of its small population, to make those concessions and, and to, 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 to hit a target. How do you overcome this kind of natural starting point uh, when you're trying to, you know, strike a compromise. Obviously, the situation in the, U in the UK with a you know, big population, 
uh, and the fact that you haven't got that much green energy at the moment. How, 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 do, you, how do you compensate okay. for that? Thank you. Just explain, sorry, is this about sort of moral authority, basically? Oh, no, no, it's, it's about, like... Oh, it's then, fine if it is, but... No, no, no. <laughs> It's about kind of the natural starting point of different countries oh, when right, you're I trying see. to get yep, compromised. Yep, yep, and also, you'd be happy to know that a big group of us are going to Copenhagen. Excellent. No, lady up here. Hello, my name's Christine. I, read, um, I was just, uh, given that you just said that uh, climate change is the biggest market failure of all time, if the Labour Party did get in, would they renationalise the major industries? And also, I was wondering if you've seen the fantastic but really shocking film, The Age of Stupid. Okay, the good news is that uh, Ed has just said to me he'll answer even more questions. So you might think it's bad news. Yeah, and anyway. so we'll just uh, take your brief answer. Okay, I will be finish, very we brief. We need to finish at eight. Right, okay. So you'll be so brief I've now, got to be disciplined. We'll go. Okay, um, Peter asked about population growth. Uh, I get asked about this a lot. I think it's worth saying, but back to the people who asked about economic growth, that we're likely to see something like, I think in the next 30 or 40 years, um, hundreds of percent of economic growth and maybe 35% population growth. So it's true that population growth makes it harder because there are more of us, but the real issue is to decouple economic growth from carbon emissions. That is, in a way, the much bigger challenge than the challenge of population growth. And whenever anyone asks me about population growth, I say, well, look, what's your solution? Uh, the solutions are the traditional and correct solutions about, it's particularly about the developing world, women's education, all the other things, development, all the other things that matter. But I think that you've got to get this in a bit of context. Matthew asked me about Plan B. I'm not, I don't love talking about Plan B, but I, I make a rule of not talking about Plan B uh, for obvious um, uh, reasons. I, I don't conceive of the way in which we go forward without uh, an agreement because I think we know that a partial agreement, which is what we had in Kyoto, is disastrous. Um, so we've got to get an agreement. Uh, and we've got to get an agreement, you know, one way or another. And in a sense, that's why, and I make no apologies for sort of raising the stakes on this, because I, don't, I think if we don't get an agreement in December, it ain't going to get any easier. In fact, it'll get more uh, difficult, in my view. Claudia, you asked about uh, smart, when you asked about energy efficiency, and say a bit more about that. Um, it's hard to make energy efficiency exciting. I'll be br brief, there, therefore. Um, uh, look... I, I think we've got to make it, and I haven't really talked about this, we've got to make it worth people's while to make the changes in energy efficiency. The, the really difficult thing is, yet, yet another difficult thing, is that it's incredibly costly to make these energy efficiency changes once you go beyond loft insulation, cavity wall insulation, which is easier um, and, and actually cheaper. But doing the stuff beyond that, which we're going to have to do, is much more expensive. It's going to need government to find a way of helping to finance this, in my view. Um, because I think if you don't do that, you're not going to get the changes uh, that uh, you need. Maria asked about uh, how do you square democracy and uh, the common good, the national uh, interest, and are we fast-tracking nuclear power stations? Um, we're trying to introduce a planning system which says politicians need to take responsibility for the need. How much need do we have in terms of uh, energy? And independent experts take the view about weighing up particular factors in relation to a specific development. I actually think people need to have an opportunity, a proper opportunity to offer a view about that and I think the new Infrastructure Planning Commission has to take heed, and it does by law have to take heed of people's views. The only point I make about this, and this does come down to political movements, is that if we say no everywhere to wind turbines then we're not going to get anywhere. And I've tried to make that point, I made myself rather unpopular with those who are saying no uh, to wind turbines, but you know, you've got to give people a chance to have a voice, but saying no everywhere is not, in my view, uh, a solution. Isabella asked about uh, Sweden, um, which is noble and advanced and, uh, you know, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, what, different starting points. One thing that I think is going to become more important as time goes by is per capita emissions. If we made it the big focus now, it would undoubtedly sort of upend our negotiations. But it is relevant that India emits 1.8 tonnes per capita and the US emits 24 tonnes per capita and U the UK about 10 tonnes per capita and China about 5 tonnes per capita. Sweden is probably very low. Uh, I don't know the Swedish number. Um, but uh, so... Um, 
so I think I think that's one way of dealing with this. And there's a school of thought which is called contraction and convergence, which is all about converging, everyone converging on a particular number. I don't think that's quite right. But I think this issue of per capita emissions is going to become part of the kind of justice argument that we have. And then. Uh, I was asked whether it was likely that if Labour was re-elected, it would re-nationalise all the major industries. I think it's unlikely, um, uh, is my answer. I, I have seen The Age of Stupid. It, the the uh, filmmaker Franny Armstrong is a friend of mine, uh, despite us uh, disagreeing on many, on many things. It's a very good film. You should go, we'll go and see it. OK, three more questions. Look, look at this. I mean, I mean it's going to be random, I'm afraid. Uh, lady at the back, who's had a hand up for a, a long time, and then we'll come to you, yes. I'm sorry, it's, it is quite a random process. Um, no, we can't. My name's Susie Byers. Uh, my question is, um, assuming that despite best efforts, uh, some parts of the world do become uninhabitable, uh, do you believe that kind of current refugee frameworks are robust enough to deal with populations displaced by climate change? Uh, and if not, what kind of adjustments or new frameworks would you propose? OK, lady with a hand up here in the f here, front. Yeah. Mike down here. Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering where Africa fits into all this uh, global deal and if African governments are actually doing enough to um, educate their people about the dangers of climate change because like for example a country like Kenya where I come from we're already having droughts, famines, I mean we're already seeing the realities of climate change so what are African governments doing and where does, do, do they fit into this deal? Thank you. Unfortunately, there's only time for one more question. I mean, Ed, Ed is not, unusually, Ed is not here to sell a book that he's just published. So if you want to speak to him afterwards, no doubt you'll, sure. you know, that there'll be an opportunity. But I'm afraid, that since we generally have to depart at eight, I'll just take one last question now. Uh, uh, Chandra Kukathas from the Government Department. Um, which do you think is the tougher problem, um, Palestine or climate change? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Can we take another one? <laughs> Couldn't you take time? Right, OK. Um, uh, uh, the last question I don't, I, I don't know the answer to. Um, they're both tough, I think, is my, uh, my politician's answer. Um, I mean, look, the, the, uh, the issue of climate change is not a, uh, is not a problem that is going to be solved. I think it's really important to say this. It's not, it doesn't get solved. I mean, it, in a way, uh, it is going to be with us um, for a sort of, you know, in a sense, uh, for at least uh, 100, 150 years, because even if you take action now, you've still got big challenges of adaptation and other things uh, uh, that we have to um, face. On the uh, question about refugees, and I'll come to the question about um, Africa, I, I don't have a very good answer on the refugee frameworks. What I know is that one of the most important arguments, and I'm glad you've asked the question, one of the most important arguments for why we have to tackle this issue is the potential refugee uh, crisis that there could be. Um, I don't know, uh, I don't have a good answer to the question of whether our frameworks are adequate, but I think, uh, it, again, it's a bit of a plan B question. I think you've, we've got to um, obviously plan for the climate change that is going to happen, but we've also got to avoid the kind of four or six degree world uh, where the refugee crisis would become uh, very difficult. Uh, to manage. On the question about Africa, I think it's good that that, that is, the, in a sense, the question uh, to end on, because it, it sort of gives me an opportunity to reflect the different sides of this, uh, um, of this, of this challenge. I, I'm interested that you say you're from Kenya. I have been on a platform now a couple of times, once by, via satellite, with someone who works for, I think it's called Northern Aid. It's an aid organization in Kenya. And you know, he tells just a very chilling story about the nomads in northern Kenya uh, and the fact that uh, they used to rely on the drought happening every 12 years, and they would prepare for that drought in the 12th year. And then it started happening every 10 years, and then it started happening every eight years, and then it started happening every six years, and now it happens every two years. And as a result, and this is the terrible injustice of climate change, the people who have done that absolutely least to cause the problem are facing the earliest and biggest uh, consequences of it. Um, African governments are doing uh, a lot to recognize the problem and are important, 
important voice. And if I'm honest, I think a, a, a voice that needs to be louder in the run-up to uh, Copenhagen. In particular, um, I'm working very closely with the minister from South Africa, um, who is playing a very important leadership role uh, in Africa. I mean, South Africa is obviously, for obvious reasons, the biggest emitter in uh, in Africa, and 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 in a sense understands its particular responsibility and has shown big leadership. Um, but I think that the most important thing in terms of the voice of Africa in, the, in this process is it, it, it emphasizes the urgency of action. But here's the positive side of this, which is the point I want to end on, which is there is huge potential for Africa in this uh, new low carbon world, because in particular of solar energy. And there are very, very exciting plans uh, in relation to a solar grid which could connect, connect to uh, North Africa, uh, for example. And so actually, I think that, in a sense, part of the uh, African story in this is gloomy because of the severe challenges that the, the continent is going to be facing as a result of climate change. But part of it is potentially positive, but it does require the developed world to live up to its responsibilities uh, at Copenhagen, not just on emissions reductions, uh, but in relation to finance. Because if that kind of change around solar energy and other things can be financed, then actually, uh, as well as Africa having to adapt to some of the real hardships of climate change, uh, there can also be put something positive uh, that comes out of it as uh, Africa makes, if you like, a transition uh, to a low carbon economy. It seems to me that successful leadership requires three things. It needs a vision, a certain sense of ruthlessness, and a coalition. Well, we can say that you have a coalition, it's clear, a hugely strong coalition that wishes you well in Copenhagen. You certainly have a vision, which I think we've positively engaged with, and I think you've set out admirably. How ruthless you are, well, you seem a very nice guy, so maybe you need to work on that. But we, we all wish you well in Copenhagen. Thank you very much.